Hello, DEF CON! <laughs> so I, I, was, uh, I didn't make my 10 o'clock speech, so I want to just say a couple of words here before we uh, introduce the man you're all here to, to see. At least I think you're here to see uh, General Alexander, aren't you? Yeah. yeah. So this is something uh, in our 20th year anniversary. I mean, it couldn't have come together uh, any better. First of all, I never thought I'd be doing this for 20 years. And, uh, and second of all, I never thought I'd have a director of the NSA and Cyber Command at the same time. Um, so for me, it's, a, it's, a, it's something I've been trying to do for almost 15 years. More than half of the life of DEF CON I've spent trying to get someone uh, from the NSA. And, and why the NSA? It's, well, they're the kind of the spookiest, um, kind of least known about. And I grew up reading the Puzzle Palace and all my collection of spy novels. And, uh, you know, much like with hackers, people sort of fear what they don't know. You know, and we've all been through that. You guys are hackers. You can probably, like, walk through walls, right? You can <laughs> sniff Wi-Fi with, like, you know, your fillings in your teeth. And, uh, and we sort of ascribe the same sort of technical capability to the NSA, but, you know, they're human just like us. And something I try to do with DEF CON is I want to expose you guys from the very first DEF CON to people you don't normally see. Like, I'm sure you guys just don't hang out and have coffee with the general. And uh, neither do I. So to me it's really eye-opening to understand, you know, the world from their view because I want to expose you to a larger sort of perspective. Um, we're going to hear all this technical, uh, sophisticated attacks, latest trends, but you probably won't really hear it from the horse's mouth how any of that fits into a larger world view. You know, I mean, well, I grew up thinking about the Internet as a global space. You know, it was my local community who I knew and it was the world. And I didn't spend a whole lot of time thinking about my nation um, because that's like a geographic thing and I'm all electronic. Um, but, you know, it, the reality is today, yeah, we live in a geographic space and we have a country and um, other people have countries. And now that the Internet has grown to such a space, we're starting to have country to country conversations about, well, what does it mean? What's Internet governance about? Uh, do we have cyber treaties? You know, how is this all going to work going forward? And so, like magic, on our 20th anniversary and the NSA's 60th anniversary, this has all come together. So with that said, I'd like to give you a, have you give a warm welcome to General Alexander. Thanks, Jeff. Can you hear me? So thanks, thanks, thanks. Honor to be here. It's an honor and a privilege to be here. You know, one of the things I want to talk about is the freedom domain, the Internet, and what we can all do to work on this. And so I've got about six hours of presentation and slides <laughs> that we'll cut down to, to some meaningful time for you. And I do want to give a chance for you to ask some questions. Hopefully they'll be easy ones. And I have a crew here that can answer the hard ones if I need to. Um, to Jeff Moss, thanks, thanks so much for the invitation out here. And thanks for all you do to bring this community, what I consider the world's best cybersecurity community together. Let's give them a big round of applause. Absolutely superb, and, and this is something that I want to hit on in a few minutes. Gail Thackeray was just up here. Let's give her a big round of applause for what she's done. And uh, Dead Attic, where are you? Thank. Let's give him a round of applause too. Okay, so so to show you that we have a sense of humor, maybe. First, this was a, a Ken Olthoff. Many of you know him. What happens to the feds that get spotted here? They get to clean up afterwards. And so, uh, you know, he was the first one that uh, was spotted out here, I think, in uh, DEF CON 1, uh, the first year. And uh, he's almost off that sentence. He's got, you know, you can see he's on the last row in the parking lot. Uh, so 20 years of cleanup, and uh, that's what happens to guys that get uh, caught. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, I have had a great time here this morning. Absolutely superb. 
Oh, it's stuck. Shoot. Does anybody know how to operate this thing? <laughs> you do? You know how, can you come up here and help me out with this? You know, it just seems to be stuck in, in, you know, I'm not sure how to get it to the next slide. Um, right? Oh. Oh, well, that was good. What's your name? Um, Sci-Fi. Sci-Fi. Oh. Let's give Sci-Fi a big hand. Come on up here. So, I don't know how many of you know Sci-Fi. Sci-Fi, we had a chance to go out to see the DEF CON kids this morning. I'll tell you absolutely superb you know to see these young people and what you've set up there and in sci-fi and a couple of others who are the other two um there's uh, yeah. chloe olivia and then kryptina we saw Kryptina. Yeah. yeah so those are the three that we saw this morning absolutely superb uh and what uh, sci-fi has done is she won the zero day exploit in fact she gave me a t-shirt and said i had to wear it right and I thought, well, what about the freedom domain? And she goes, there's nothing more important than DEF CON kids and what they've done. And I'll tell you, from my perspective, there's nothing more important than what you and your folks have done. So don't get nervous. <laughs> <laughs> so we have, this is Sci-Fi's t-shirt. Sci-Fi zero day, absolutely superb. And I'll tell you, we have great people like Sci-Fi all over and in this audience, all of you. And what it takes, we put up here on, on this slide, it takes great people to, to really bring together what our nations need, all our nations, better cybersecurity. So this is for you. Thank, Thank you. you. Let's give her a big round of applause, folks. OK, you know where the right arrow is? You want to stay up for a little bit? Okay, all right, she's gonna go down. So I'm on my own again. <laughs> so one of the things I wanted to talk about, I did have a chance to, uh, to actually go out and see everything around here. I didn't get to spend a lot of time. I am absolutely impressed with some of the stuff that's going on here. Uh, for barcode, the blood code stuff that's set up, and the fact that, it, let's give them a big round of applause. Absolutely superb. You know that, that you, would, that you would come together for somebody who has a need and give blood, I am really impressed. That, that's absolutely superb. You should all be very proud of yourselves. I am. And I'm proud to be associated with you. What I want to talk about, cybersecurity, education. In this room, this room right here, is the talent our nation needs to secure cyberspace. And there's some issues that we have with cyberspace when you look at it. First, you know, we need great people like sci-fi that can help educate older people like me and some of the folks who don't really understand this. You folks understand cybersecurity. You know that we can protect the networks and have civil liberties and privacy. And you can help us get there. Now, some of the things that we're going to talk about is how do we take the next step? You know, there are some things that I'm working my way through to understand cybersecurity. I want to walk through those with you and see what we can do together to help secure cyberspace, build better tools, train and educate the American people and our allies and other nations on better cybersecurity. What does it take to get legislation? I had a chance to meet up with some of the EFF folks. And some of you know here and can help us show the world that you can actually do intrusion detection and prevention systems and ensure civil liberties and privacy. Showing that to the world is absolutely important because we can do both and we need to do both. Back on my own. Just a minute, Sci-Fi, we might need you here in a second. Oh, look at that. So when you look at what's going on and you look at the stuff here, you know, I was just looking at the phone system that you all set up here. You know, this is absolutely superb. You have your own little phone system and it's running and they handed out the phones to everybody. What, what is it called? The hacker? Hacker net? The ninja net. Ninja net. Um, so you set up your own phone. Um, look at the phones and where they're going. The mobile devices. Just about everyone in here 
owns a mobile device. Actually, most of you own two, three, or four. You have your iPhones or your uh, Android. You have an iPad. You have uh, wireless and wired devices. And you have all this great technology. And what's going what's to happen over the next several years? It's going to continue to grow. Look at what's, what's happened over the last few years, where we've gone from. Last year, there were over 460 million cell phones sold. This room bought half of them. <laughs> and great opportunities when you look at the, the calculation and capabilities in this equipment for solving some of our, our nations, our allies, and the world's problems, especially in healthcare. Think of the things that we're going to be able to do in a few years. We're going wireless. The ability to connect to that network is absolutely superb. I had a chance to go over to the wireless uh, section and, and walk by that and see what you're doing. Tremendous vulnerabilities that we've got to address. So there are tremendous opportunities that you can see on here. And I think, uh, and I put on here DEF CON kids. Uh, from my perspective, the greatest opportunity educating the next generation that's going to come on beyond us, like Sci-Fi and her teammates there. This is our future. And what you're doing here to help train those folks, absolutely superb. And you should be very proud. Now, there's some, there some tremendous vulnerabilities out there. Uh, when you look at what's going on in the network, there's a lot of companies with tremendous cybersecurity experience that are still getting hacked. And I've put some of them up here. And just to give you some insights, when you look at some of the ways those have hacked, those zero-day exploits that Sci-Fi made, and she's going to help me out because she did hers in a game to actually run it faster in time or to get out in front of it in time. And that can help me beat my kids. Um, but it's also those type of exploits are used to get into some of these companies that are the best in the world at cybersecurity. From my experience, what we find out is they're the best, they know they've been hacked. There's more than 10 times, almost 100 times, more companies out there that don't know they've been hacked. Tremendous vulnerabilities. And we've got to figure out how to work together to solve that. OK, I'm getting better at this sci-fi. That training session helped. Um, so we have some shared challenges, and you can see those here. Um, a global community with great risk from exploitation, disruption, and destruction. And what do I mean by that? And, and why am I putting this up here? You can see that the last decade plus has been exploitation, uh, cyber hacking, penetration testing, da da da. And you see disruption, distributed denial of service attacks. And my concern is that's going to flow into destructive attacks that could have significant consequences on our nation's critical infrastructure, government networks, the internet itself. And we've got to figure out how to secure that. So we have a joint challenge because the reality is this is the community that helped build many of those tools that we're going to need. Uh, you understand this. You understand what's going on. You know, I, I had a chance to go over to capture the flag stuff that's, that's going on there. This community, better than anyone, understands where this is going and what we need to do to help our nation and our allies fix this. So let me go to the next slide. So we also have some shared principles and responsibilities. And, and I've listed those out here because I think from my perspective, we all have the same approach to this. Um, and you can see what we've laid out. I think from, from my perspective, we all share this responsibility. This is not the government can fix it. This is not private industry that's going to fix it. This is we're going to fix it, and that's what it's going to take, a team approach. Um, we have to be collaborative. How do we do that? One of the things that we can't do today is very easily share between government and industry for protection of critical networks. That's part of the cyber legislation. We need to address that. Uh, and you know, from my perspective, watching what's going on in Congress, I think both parties see this as a significant problem. They're debating this today. It's ironic, while we're out here, they're debating 
cyber legislation that would allow us to share information and take it a next step. What are the standards that we should jointly set, industry, you all, government, that critical infrastructure and networks should have to ensure their security? How do we do that? And one of the things I point to is, well, look at the SANS Critical 20 uh, network configuration and, and settings that we ought to do. Those are things that we should look at, and we should address that. And from my perspective, this is all about our future. And there's a lot of things that are going on here. We can sit on the sidelines and let others who don't understand this space tell us what they're going to do, or we can help by educating and informing them on the best strategy forward that benefits all of us and our nation. And that's the real reason that I came here, to solicit your support. Because from my perspective, if we had everybody in this room for a few weeks working together on this, we could solve many of those issues. You have, that's right, you have the talent, you have the expertise, yeah, that's right, thank you. And, you know, when I look out here and seeing some of the stuff that you're doing, absolutely superb. I know you're waiting to see if I turn around with this on here and tear it up. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about the technical side of this. I know that's what you really want to hear. You know, I, we have great folks in the government, just like you. Uh, as Jeff said, we have some tremendous folks. And uh, when I look out at some of those folks and some of the things that we've developed, you can see it up here, some of the tools that you've developed. Think about it, SNORT, that intrusion detection system and how that's used, NMAP, the backtrack system, Metasploit, Nessus. These are great tools for penetration testing uh, and hacking. And from my perspective, when I look at those, this community, we develop those. We need to take it to the next step. Now, I know Whit Diffie couldn't be here, one of the key guys on the internet, uh, along with Vint Cerf, you start to bring some of these guys together. They're the ones that help build it. And we've, we've had some folks that have done some great things too. And I just wanna talk about that for a second so you know where we're coming from, from a government perspective. Because it doesn't need to be a separate set of objectives. We have a joint mission here, I think. So I, put, I started out with World War II. No, I did not fight in World War II, let me just... <laughs> I was only nine at the time. Um, no, when you look at World War II, the fate of our nation and our allies hung in the balance over some of these codes that you see up here. The Japanese codes, purple, uh, JN25, and a series of those. And when you think about it, those are the codes that allowed us to win in the Pacific, midway. Google that, not all at once. Um, but when you look at it, some cryptologists were able to, to confirm that the Japanese were gonna attack at Midway, allowing our Navy to get a strategic advantage. And they did it based on people like you, who broke the crypto thing, Cryptina, and were able to read that mail. Enigma, Enigma, there's a great story here on Enigma. The allies, our allies, Poland, France, Britain, broke Enigma, the three rotor system, and we've got a couple out there. Three times 10 to the 114th power. I was told to memorize that, I'm not sure why. <laughs> think about the possibilities, so to speak. Uh, and when you think about Enigma, by our ability to break that code, you got it. oh, I thought, you know, I was at airborne training, so normally that means get ready to jump out of the airplane. <laughs> <laughs> 10 minutes. Mm. Okay, we could, we'll do some of those uh, Jody calls in a minute. That's right, boom. Uh, it's better, if you're gonna to go to airborne training, it's better to have a shoot on your back, I'm just telling you. So Enigma, let's think about Enigma and what that did. The three rotor system gave us a strategic advantage. We sank many of the submarines that were sinking our ships that helped uh, our allies in Europe. Admiral Donitz, the German Navy, realized something was amiss. And he tried to get the engineers in Germany, their people, to change it. And they said, there's no way this can be broken. It's impossible to break it. Aha, 
you all know, we do the impossible every day. And so he had it on a fourth rotor. The fate of the world swung in their balance for nine months while the Allies worked on breaking that. And there are some great stories about people who gave their lives to break that code. Some Navy folks who went aboard a sinking submarine and died getting Enigma machines to help us win that war. And think of this. If the Germans knew at that time that we could break those codes, they would have changed it and the war may have come out vastly different. That is one of the key reasons the government has to keep secrets. It's not to keep them from you, it's to keep them from our adversaries, but if we share them too widely, everyone is gonna know about those. Um, and when you look at the, the Tiger teams and things that we've set up starting in the 1970s for, for people to go out and work on the networks, to actually get out there and see what could happen with these machines, it started in the 70s. People realized, hmm, we've got problems coming up in cybersecurity. And that started all in the 70s, building out these teams, going to DES to follow on an AES encryption. I wanted to mention the DIB pilot, because I think the DIB pilot and our partnership with DHS and FBI, that's your government cyber team. And you had Mark Weatherford here earlier. I'll tell you, Mark is great to work with. Be nice to him. He's a good person. He's, he's got a tough job on the DHS side. And FBI, tremendous people. Director Bob Muller, absolutely one of the finest people in this country. Absolutely superb. His heart is in the right direction. What, what do we do as a team? When you think about that team, FBI has the law enforcement, the criminal side. DHS is the public face to work with industry and the private section. NSA and Cyber Command, our job is to protect the nation from a cyber attack and foreign intelligence. Now here's the issue. If we can't see a cyber attack, how do you stop it? We could write essays on this, right? If you don't see a cyber attack, how do you stop it? Well, that's a good one, um, because that's where we are right now. Ironically, NSA does not sit around our, com our country and look in. We have no insights if Wall Street is going to be attacked. So the DIB pilot is a pilot of how we can work with industry and get tips and cues. Think of this as the 911. We can give them information to help protect their networks, and they can tell us from their intrusion detection systems when an event occurs at network speed. The reality, and those of you familiar with IDS, IPS, SNORT, and all these systems know that you can use these data files, event files, and other things, and all you need to pass is the fact of a signature and IP addresses in real time, and we can take it from there. So think of us as the firemen on the network. Or think of this as the easy pass as you're going up the highway. All we need, that beeping was me, that's because I was backing up. Um, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> My wife does that to me all the time. Um, so when you, when you think about that, uh, an easy pass is a great way. When you go down the highway and you go through the easy pass lane, right? All of us got those easy pass. No, nope, I know you guys can break it. Uh, we'll talk about that later. But as you're going down, what you're doing is just sending that code. That, that system is not looking in your car, seeing who's in your car, getting facial identification or anything like that, reading the mail on that or intercepting anything. It's just getting that code. And what we need for cybersecurity is something analogous to that. That's one of the things that I'd ask you to work and help push between folks here. I think that'll be uh, very important. You know about SE Linux and SE Android, so I'm gonna skip over those. It shows that we're willing to push stuff out to industry to help provide more secure stuff. Here we are. No, I'm not gonna say who's who, but we were separated at birth with a common cause. Uh, I know I got a long ways to go if I'm gonna work out, so I'm perhaps halfway between Danny and the other guy there. Uh, I, I put this up there, I thought it was funny, but I also think it kind of sets the tone for what we should think of. You know, we have a common set of shared values. Many of the people that, we, that work for us have also worked with you and go back and forth. Becky Bates, look at what she did on intrusion detection systems and how she helped start a lot of the things going on in the company that she has now formed. Dave Atoll, Ron Gula, 
great people working significant stuff that started out at NSA and now work closely with many of you. Think about uh, Deb Franke, who worked at PNNL. She got funding from uh, Becky Bass, and now she's the deputy of research at NSA. And you know other folks like Mudge and other ones like that that are in the government. We need great talent. We don't pay as high as some of the others. We're fun to be around. <laughs> so think of it like that. But I do think that we have to have this interchange. So, some of the things that I want to talk about here, I know I'm going to get the hook, uh, is uh, shared principles. The principles upon which we should secure cyberspace. And I think these uh, set those. And I, I'll just hit the last one here because sometimes you guys get a bad rap. From my perspective, what you're doing to figure out vulnerabilities in our systems is absolutely needed. We've got to discover and fix those. That's hard work takes technically suave and boner folks like you, and you do a great job at it. And you got to know the line. There are some great books out there, and I know all of you know those lines. And I know you all adhere to that, so that's great. Um, well, mostly. Uh, but on the internet, I think the third bullet down is what we really want to do, is innovate, freedom, how we're going to look at where we take this next. This is a great opportunity for not only our nation, but for the world. And you know, one of the things that I'm really proud of saying is, when you look at Vint Cerf and the others, we're the ones who helped develop. We're the ones who built this internet. And we ought to be the first ones to secure it. And I think you folks can help us do that. So we have that shared responsibility. We have a shared responsibility to fix that. And I want to talk briefly about what we're doing uh, from my perspective. And you can all pile in on this, and I know Jeff has got a great way for, for getting your feedback and getting that to me. But when you look at it, there's five things that I'm trying to do as both the director of the National Security Agency and the commander of U.S. Cyber Command. First, how do you see cyberspace? How do you visualize it? Where is the graphical user interface for cyber defense? We haven't yet made the transition that the gaming industry and others have done in network security, but there are opportunities here that are superb. Defensible architectures. When you look at some of the networks in government, you know, the Defense Department's network has 15,000 enclaves. How would you like to have my job defend those 15,000 when you know others are configuring those based on what they feel is right, even when we pass guidance? It's hard to do that. So we need to come up with a more defensible architecture. From my perspective, we need to reduce the attack surface by going to things like thin virtual cloud. That's not perfect, but it's, it's a step in the right direction. And it helps us in the mobility area. We need to look at the command and control. How are we going to work with other government agencies and within the Defense Department here? We need to set the authorities. And I think that's where cyber legislation that's going on right now is so important for our country, both for the information sharing side and setting the standards. And perhaps the most important, and what you do tremendous here, and what I would like some feedback from you is training and educating people on this. You know, when I look at some of the courses and some of the things that you're doing from the DEF CON kids all the way up to Capture the Flag and some of the things that Jeff and you all have going, what are the lessons learned on how we should now train our military and civilian force for defending our nation? What are the standards that we should set? What are the types of courses and the abilities that they should have to do the job that you depend on them and our allies depend? And how do we share that? That's one of the great things that we need to do and that's one of the things that you all can help us do. And that you all makes it sound like I'm from the South. And I, I am, I'm South Side of Syracuse, so. <laughs> so, the future. What future do you want? How are we gonna get there? From my perspective, you all can help us set that future. What, what I want, you know, I have four daughters, Two are computer programmers, one's an aeronautical engineer, 
swayed a little bit from the, tra the path there. One's a social worker, and, and we need her. She's, she's great at it. I have 14 grandchildren. I know, that's a lot. Yeah, and I'm only, what, like 30? And, <laughs> and, and you look at it, it is so impressive to see the two-year-olds with the, the, playing with the iPads and the other systems today. Those things that you're helping to build, they're playing with. They're going to be much better educated than I was. They're going to advance this a lot further. So what you're building is absolutely good for our future. So thanks. Thanks. I have a couple more slides. We can take cybersecurity to the next level. What we need from you, how we educate and train people, how we see cyberspace, how we build the tools of the future. Those tools that can help you do much more than, than we're capable of today. Because today it's one-on-one. -on -one. And when you look at cyberspace and the number of problems that we face, it's one-on-many. How do we visualize that? How do we set that up for the future? These are the things that we're really going to need to push on. And we absolutely need you to help us do this. Truth in lending. So, <laughs> as you know, I told Ken, you know, he's out there sweeping the parking lot, and he uh, put his broom down for him, and he says, you know, you're going to go out there, and they're going to know that you're a Fed. I actually now have that T-shirt, too. And uh, I didn't even get out of the parking lot before they had me sweeping the South 20 there. So uh, everybody serves that. You know, the reality is I want you to know, from my perspective, I think getting government people out here to talk and have this uh, this dialogue is absolutely vital for our country. How do we take it to the next step? And I think having EFF, having the social engineering, having everybody here together, we ought to discuss this. You have great insights, and we ought to help our nation solve that problem. I'll tell you, from my perspective, it was a privilege and honor to walk through this morning with Jeff Moss and his folks and see all the great things that are going on. Stand up one more time, Sci-Fi. Let's give Sci-Fi a big round of applause and Jeff Conkick. You know, I, uh, everybody said uh, that I was important. That's the most important person for our future and the kids that you're training. So, Nico, absolutely superb what you're doing. It was a privilege and honor to meet you. So, thanks. Okay, with that, questions. No questions, I'm out of here. <laughs> Not so lucky. Yeah. Okay, Are these so multiple choice? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to start with the easy one. Um, so, and it's probably one of the top requested ones. So does the NSA really keep a file on any of you one? And if so, how can I see mine? Because <laughs> I'm yeah. really curious to see what's in it. Does this mean all six billion people? No, no, just the United States, I <laughs> just think. Just the United States. You know, at first, uh, there are so many things you could say are funny, but I think this requires a very serious answer. First, no, we don't. Absolutely not. And anybody who would tell you that we're keeping files or dossiers on the American people, no, that's not true. And let me tell you why. First, under our agency, we have a responsibility. Our job is foreign intelligence. We get oversight by Congress, both intel committees and their congressional members and their staffs. So everything we do is auditable by them, by the FISA court, so the judiciary branch of our government, and by the administration. And everything we do is accountable to them. And within the administration, it's from the Director of National Intelligence. It's from the Department of Justice. It's from the Department of Defense. I feel like when I was a kid growing up, and some of you may feel like this too, you know, you might get in a little trouble, you're supervised a lot, maybe you had to spend time in the hall. Well, that's the way I feel today. We are overseen by everybody. And I will tell you that those who would want to weave the story that we have millions or hundreds of millions of dossiers on people is absolutely false. Let me take it to the next step. Under the FISA Amendment Act, we are authorized to collect foreign targets, think of terrorists, outside the United States. And that law allows us to use our, some of our infrastructure to do that. 
we have to, we may incidentally, in targeting a bad guy, hit on somebody from a good guy because there is a discussion there. We have requirements from the FISA court and the attorney general to minimize that, which means nobody else can see it unless there's a crime that's been committed. And every one of those are auditable by all those branches of government. And so from my perspective, the, the people who would say that we're doing that should know better. With another thing, think of that, 260 million dossiers or however many you'd come out. Let's see, if you're trying to maintain those dossiers, I'm not a real good mathematician, but let's say we have 20,000 people working that. How many files do each of us have to work? And I'm not that kind of a guy that's going to work all those files. So I think, from my perspective, this is absolute nonsense. Next. And so, so where do I get my file again? <laughs> no, I'm just gonna... <laughs> um, okay, here's a question. I want to mix it up. Here's a question um, from the Twitterverse from Smart Alec. How has military thinking progressed to consider a million front war? Is such a war winnable? A million front? front meaning online. Right. Well, I think today, and I had a chance uh, yesterday to be out to Aspen, I was asked, where do we see the defense of our country in cyberspace? And we have some issues. We can't see that. So right now on a million front war, smart Alex is probably what it was. Alex yeah. with an X, like Alexander Alex. Um, when you, that was a joke, I'm sorry, I work it. Oh, <laughs> I can go slower. Um, when you think about it, first we've got to be able to see it. Then we have to have the ability to share that information. And then we have to have what we talked about is the tools to actually take on a million front. And that's where you're going to have to come in and help us. And that's where we're going to have to work together. Because that's not something today that we're ready to do. And one of the other questions that goes along with it is the offense, does it have the advantage? And especially if you can't see it, yes, they do. So those are the things that the government, both parts of Congress and the administration are working to address right now. So, uh, so you're in a very unique uh, position. On stage. On stage, right at my conference. Um, in that there's never been before a, a single person in, uh, head of both the NSA and a newly, hey, watch, I've got to pay for that. <laughs> and, a, uh, and the newly formed Cyber Command. So do you have sort of a, a split personality? Do you wake up sometimes at night, you know, Cyber Command, NSA. Uh, how do you decide, or how is that line made, and, um, and, and is that a, a productive way to go forward with the defense of the country? Yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> which hat was which? Um, a actually, I think it absolutely is the right way to go. Uh, and just, uh, you know, two hats. Um, I don't get two paychecks. I found that out last week. Uh, Actually, when I came into the job, I've been in the job now almost seven years. And you might wonder, why has he been in the job so long? First, um, they said, you have to do a few things that are important before you can leave. <laughs> so I'm going to be there for a while. Uh, when I came in, I was actually the director of NSA and the commander of the Joint Functional Component Command Net Warfare. So I was always dual-hatted or triple-hatted because we count the chief uh, central security service as a third hat. And so from my perspective, the team, the Defense Department and the intelligence community team that works on the network, that helps defend the network, NSA has both the foreign intelligence and the information assurance side. Mm. So that team that has those skills, Cyber Command needs to work with. And if we couldn't leverage that team, we'd have to go build another team. And it doesn't make sense, because we could never build the capability that we have at NSA. We couldn't rebuild it, we couldn't afford it, it would take us years. So we need to leverage it. Many of our allies are doing similar things, and it makes a lot of sense. In fact, what that really gets us to is this cyber team concept. So within the Defense Department, we've built that team together. Within our government, we have the FBI, DHS, Cyber Command and NSA. That's the government cyber team. Then we have industry, and now you. That's the team our nation needs, and now we need to work with our allies to secure cyberspace. And that's where I think we need to go. Yeah, that's uh, actually a perfect feed into my next question, which is uh, how does NSA cooperate with others, not just you know our allies or our favorite friends, but 
people who are maybe on the fence, um, you know, you still have to share information. So do you see that as a critical component of future success is actually information sharing and reliance on other people because you can't do it all yourself? You know, we, as I said, we have great people and you know some of these great people. And what they take to their heart is we have a couple of missions that we have to perform. We don't want a terrorist attack on our country. And that's first and foremost in our mind. We don't want a cyber attack on our country. We don't want your um, critical information getting hacked into and bank accounts and other things going down. When we look at vulnerabilities and we discover those, we look at those and we share those with industry. Now, it might not be with the big NSA moniker on it. We would actually work that with DHS and FBI, push that out to them for the good of the country. What I am really proud of is the way our people look at that and do that for the good of this country. So when you see a lot of these vulnerabilities that are getting uh, fixed, many of those our folks have found. And many of our folks found those by working with you. So thank you. Okay, I've only got a couple questions left. Um, so it's organizational question um, from Dave Itell. And uh, how big should Cyber Command be? Ultimately bigger than the Navy, bigger than the NSA? Well, that's a good question. Um, big enough <laughs> to do the job. I, I clearly do not see it uh, bigger than the Navy or any other service. In fact, I do see the mission growing. And the real issue is, for the good of our country, we have uh, an economic crisis. Many of you may not heard about that. Um, one of the things that I and many of the folks in government feel is that we should fix that on our watch. So we don't want to grow the military and other things way up to solve a problem. So one of the issues that I would throw back to you all is help us come up with the tools that would allow us to do this, not one on a million, everybody taking one of those million, which would be a million person cyber force, but how do you do this and scale it? and how do we get the talent and the people that we need. From my perspective, I believe that when we look at the cyber community that we have today, what we're actually building together is our ops and defend people, bringing together with the exploit and the attack people, and what we're looking at is the ops and defend people under our legacy system is really big. And so if we could go to the new architecture, you would need less of these type of people, say sysadmin and this kind, and more that we could then train to be full spectrum cybersecurity folks, trained to your standard that would know how to find people penetrating the networks. And that's what I think we've got to do. So what I would like is to try to um, actually evolve our community and shift it to where we need to be, not to grow it per se. Now, will we need to grow in some areas? Absolutely, but we'll shrink in others. And I think at the end of it, when I look at it, what I've told the Chairman and the Secretary of Defense, I think we can actually do both missions with less people in the future with some of the technology that we have coming on and with your help. So that, that brings me up to a personal question, which is an automation. Um, so we're a pretty big country, 300 plus million or so, but botnets can have millions uh, of nodes. And if it's a one-on-one -on -one type of game, you know, uh, we're going to lose. If it's a one, on, one of our defenders against one of their attackers, you'll never win that game. So you have to automate. And so, so to me, and I'm, I'm curious, does NSA see the future as, as sort of automation? Automate everything you can and then learn how to automate everything else. So we keep humans doing the human jobs, the challenging jobs that computers can't do. Um, is that's, in my view, is probably only the one way that we can tackle this problem. Is, is there sort of similar thinking? Well, I, I think you've hit it on the head. I would tell you that, and you would work your way through it just as you did there, that it makes sense to automate where we can. And as many of you know who automate things, to have people who can reverse engineer it and say, is this a viable concept, this automation, or do I have a real problem? You know, I've built an Enigma machine and then find out that somebody broke through it when I trusted implicitly that this was good to go. Right. And the reality, you know, so this is secure. Nobody can hack into it. And then what you find out is that everybody's hacking into it, and the only one who thinks it's secure is me. 
right. uh, that yeah. would be a, a big problem. So I think what we want is the combination, automate where we can, have real time capabilities to defend, and have people, great people, trained to a standard that can help bring all that together and continue to grow this. So as you look at what you do here every year, you get a chance to look at evolving technology. Look at what's happened in the 20 years that you've had your folks here. And we've brought this group together. Um, and look at what you discussed 20 years ago and the state of the art. And look at where the state of the art is today. It's superb. This is phenomenal. One of the greatest things going on right now and the trend for the future. Mm -hmm. You know, you guys are the greatest demand in demand for our nation. And so when you think about that, now the thing is, so we would want to automate and we want to move it to the next step. And we want people that can help us get there and continue to climb that, that road, share it with our allies, build the, the best mm -hmm. network in the world, secure the freedom domain that I started out with. I think that's what we will all want to get to, and I think we can get there. And along the way, it doesn't mean that people aren't going to throw rocks at it and try to take it down. And we've got to be able to stop that. Go ahead. Yeah, so here's uh, your final question. Um, so if you could have a perfectly secure internet or a nicely insecure internet, which would you choose? I would, I would choose, <laughs> I would choose this, the perfectly secure internet. Here's why. I think it is in our nation's best interest. Look at all the intellectual property that we've lost over the past decade. It's huge. That's our nation's future. That's the future for young folks like sci-fi and others. That means others will take advantage of that intellectual property at our expense. And same with our allies. They're having the same thing happen. And so if we could fix that, that would help us on our economic growth. This would be huge for our country. And this, this area that we're talking about is the fastest growing area in our nation for the past three decades. Look at what makes up our, the Dow Industrial, the NASDAQ. Look at all the companies that deal in this sector. That's what fuels our economy. Yeah. That's where we need to be. So from my perspective, for my grandchildren, for you all, for us, that's what we need to do. And I think it's doable. It's not going to be easy. And I think we should go at it with the thought of it'll never be perfect. We can't get to perfect. But we can come really close. I didn't mention in one of the slides that our nation created two cryptologic systems, SIGABA and SIG Sally. These were both data and voice communications that were used during World War II. We were able to crack our adversaries' communications and protect our own. We can do this in cyberspace and continue to build towards a perfect internet that would be good for the world. And we ought to all push for that. And I think when you bring in not only our great talent here, but those of our allies, I think that's absolutely superb. All right, that brings this session to a close. So let's have a round of applause for General Alexander.